Welcome all. My name is Michael Downey, and it's fantastic to be here for another AWRI webinar. This is the second of four initial sessions that have been released as part of the 2019-20 program. In coming weeks, we'll be discussing a new Wine Australia application for vineyard mapping and maceration techniques for developing wine styles in reds. Today's session, however, has been planned to assist growers managing weeds in the vineyard. But before I jump over to today's speaker, some very quick reminders for the audience. To provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send it through. We'll be running a dedicated Q&A at the end of Tony's presentation. If you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the, uh, at the underscore AWRI. The webinar is also being recorded and will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. Now, for those of you that have just joined us, welcome. Today's AWRI, AWRI webinar is on how weeds can influence a vineyard. And I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker. So in the room with me today is Tony Hoare, a senior viticulturist here at the AWRI. Tony has wide ranging uh, viticultural experience, holding various roles associated with establishing and managing vineyards, and is co-owner of McLaren Vale Winery, Cellar Door and Restaurant, Beach Road Wines. It's fantastic to have Tony on board for today's webinar, and with that, I'll hand over to Tony to get us started. Thank you, Michael, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for uh, logging on to join in to the webinar today. What I'm looking at talking about today is, is the influence of weeds in a vineyard situation. I guess we're looking at um, how perceptions of weed control have changed over a period of time in Australian viticulture. Uh, we can see here there's a, a range of images on this slide which shows a different array of weed management options in vineyards. Um, on the left, you have a bit more of a, um, a natural approach. In the middle, you have what has sort of commonly occurred below with a, a weedicide strip using herbicides. Above that, you have what is sort of translated into more of a cultivation and to the right, um, definitely clean cultivation. So what are the benefits of these different types of weed control? and how do they influence the growth of vines. There seems to be a new way of thinking developing in viticulture at the moment, which is um, where use, we can look at floor management differently to how we may have done traditionally. So rather than look at a simple input replacement, we need to develop new vineyard floor management systems, which provide environmental enhancement, are cost effective, have low fossil fuel requirements that are more driven by photosynthesis and the growth of plants, in other words, are readily implemented and require low maintenance and that fit the vineyard ecosystem and provide the required productivity outcomes that we expect for productive viticulture. Chris Penfold has um, provided a really good summary of how we could potentially use our floor system to benefit viticulture. And he has four goals um, with his philosophy. The first one is to reduce the need for herbicide use. The second one is to have an improvement to soil health, to grow plants which are beneficial to the grapevine, potentially leading to improved yields and or quality and to improve vineyard profitability and ecological sustainability. To achieve those goals, Chris has proposed a situation where there is full year round cover of the soil. And that is done using species that have been adapted to the environment in the viticultural climate um, that also benefit the vineyard by not competing for water use and actually enhance water availability that help improve biodiversity for IPM management 
for provide soil cover for protection from erosion and um, competition with weeds, provide nutrient provision through improved soil moisture capability and, um, and reduce competition from other weeds, which may be negative. And then also providing a grazing biomass for um, livestock, which can be used to graze for weeds. I'll just start with what a weed is. Um, so we can understand the traditional approach um, to weed management, how we are looking at it differently now. So weeds are essentially an opportunistic plant or a gate crasher. They're very highly adapted. They require low nutrient generally to establish themselves and low water, and they're very fast to grow through a vegetative stage and then set seed. And they really only require three things, sunlight, water, and bare soil, or in the situation with this image, rock. So the problem with weeds in vineyards is that they compete for water, nutrients, and light. They can also harbor insect pests, and I've mentioned some there. Um, they can pose a fire risk in some situations. They can also be quite visually unattractive and untidy, um, and that has been, um, I guess, uh, a mindset that we have had in viticulture for some time that uh, weeds do tend to bring down the image of a vineyard, particularly around cellar doors. Uh, they can have some occupational health and safety implications for vineyard um, hands, people um, visiting the vineyard, the contractors, particularly the burr weeds. They can damage or disrupt machinery operations. A uh, wire weed is, a, is a, a classic weed for that problem with the disking, rotary hoeing. They can contaminate, taint, or reduce value crops. Um, reduce, sorry, reduce the value of crops, e.g. Um, black nightshade and fat hen, which usually rears itself around raison when um, it's very difficult to control and can taint fruit. Some of the woody weeds like gorse and blackberry can also lower land value as well. Then there's biosecurity obligations. If there are inherent um, weeds which are classified as, um, as noxious weeds, there is an obligation to control those weeds if you're the landholder. Then they can also harbour virus and disease as well, which can negatively affect the vineyard. So there's a large cost to weeds and trying to control weeds in the Australian agricultural economy, uh, $4 billion per annum. Uh, estimated back in 2004. Um, herbicides constitute 1.7 billion of, um, of weed control in 2017 and 2018. And that doesn't take into account the additional costs of labor, fuel, machinery purchase and maintenance for applying weedicide, freight and storage of the chemicals, OHS, PPS, and then the water to um, dilute the chemicals. The AWRI commissioned a survey of viticultural practices um, earlier in the year and the results have come back. And you can see here that um, we have a very heavily rel heavy reliance on herbicides in Australian viticulture with 85% of us using herbicides for undervine management. Whilst that looks like a, a high percentage nationwide, um, it could be looked upon as being um, quite an exaggeration when you look at the amount of um, applications that we do use with most people using um, one or two herbicides per annum. So when does a, a plant become a weed problem? I've got an example here um, of a plant growing out of place. Um, essentially um, a weed is an unintentional actively growing plant that has a negative physical or financial effect on the functioning and management of an agricultural system. Here you can see there's a river red gum, which is growing in a vineyard, um, which looks quite innocuous. However, eucalyptus leaves contain cinnanol, um, which is a, um, a characteristic compound that produces eucalyptus, fresh, cool, medicinal, camphorous characters. Um, there is a very low threshold um, for contamination in wine. So 
Uh, the work done by Dimi Capone below showed that when leaves from gum trees end up in canopies and then into must, they can contaminate wine and leave cinnanol taint. Um, and as low a threshold of 67.5 grams per tonne of grapes will result in 213 micrograms per litre of cinnanol when the uh, consumer rejection threshold is only 27.5 micrograms per litre. So where do weeds come from? Uh, they generally, as I mentioned before, are gate crashes. So they just blow in from roadsides, farm perimeters around sheds. Um, they get carried in um, by wind vehicles, stock, employees, contractors, customers, tourists, feral animals, and also can be imported in mulch. There's a vehicle image here which shows um, where noxious weeds were actually found within a vehicle. I think Peter Pasalis of that image. Weeds love bare soil. So practices of cultivation, which have been quite common in um, past viticultural management, uh, do encourage the growth of weeds. And here are some situations here to illustrate that. If we look at that as being the way to encourage weeds by having open soil, it makes sense then that the best way to control weeds is to cover the soil through weed suppression. You can see the image on the left here where it's a tree crop which is being established utilising a black plastic for weed control around the new saplings. And then on the right, a common site in a lot of vineyards around Australia these days, um, the utilisation of, of straw as mulch. Mulches are um, a fantastic way of suppressing weeds. They provide a thick covering of the soil. They block out the light and suppress weed germination. And they also um, act with other benefits to preserve soil moisture um, by reducing evaporation from the soil and also lower soil temperatures, which is a consideration in, in hot um, summers, which we seem to be experiencing more frequently. The various options for Mulch, um, the majority of people rely on straw when it's commonly available and, and um, when the price is um, economical. Um, grape mark is a great source also of organic um, material for mulch when it's applied in a, a thick um, rate of up to 150 cubic metres per hectare. Wood chips quite often mixed in with grape mark and as are manures. The inorganic options are less, um, less utilised by industry, but um, could provide some potential for new plantings um, in the future, depending upon um, their cost effectiveness. The cost of mulch is initially expensive for spreading and for purchasing. Um, however, the cost needs to be amortised out over two to three years. Um, and the benefit, the associated benefits need to be considered as well with water saving, herbicide saving, um, and also labour for diesel. There are additional benefits to mulch, as I mentioned. Um, they also have a, a, um, a, a positive effect on beneficials. So they help encourage uh, some of the um, hymenoptera, um, parasitoids and spiders. And they also, of course, promote earthworm activity, which helps with drainage, the uptake of and availability of nutri nutrient from the soil. But there are some considerations. So it's important to understand the risk of fire um, with the vineyard with mulch. There can be a, a nutrient depletion of nitrogen as the mulch breaks down over time. So there may be some compensation required there. And that can be monitored above ground by taking PTL tests at pre-flowering in vines and also post-harvest with leaf blades. Rainfall can sometimes, um, the penetration of rainfall can be reduced depending upon mulch thickness and the type of mulch used. Um, it is recommended um, if you are using straw that 20% of that straw is actually milled or um, made into a fine material so that that does provide some um, access of water through the mulch um, during winter. Chris Penfold from the University of Adelaide has 
been researching the growth of undervine crops for use in viticulture as to provide a benefit. And he has been looking at maintaining soil cover in the vineyard floor all year round, which is the goal. Um, he's also been looking at different species, which um, are regionally specific. Um, obviously, um, there's not one species that suits every situation. So Chris has done a, a trial looking at a variety of species. The management um, can be flexible depending upon the seasons. So I think Chris is um, looking at whether the, um, the different species do provide um, different benefits in different seasons and that they can be changed depending upon the seasons quite quickly. The system that Chris has been looking at does seem to tick all the sustainability boxes and he really encourages everybody to um, look into his research and, um, and have a go if you haven't thought about it already. There are lots of weed control options. We've been very heavily reliant on synthetic chemicals for quite some time. And a lot of the other options have been seen as being um, optional, um, but not widespread. We're now seeing um, a lot of these um, less popular options being reconsidered now in viticulture. Rather than controlling weeds, can we use weeds to benefit the vineyard? There definitely are benefits associated with weeds in viticulture, particularly when it comes to erosion control um, on hilly slopes, especially organic matter, soil health and mulch. Um, weeds can provide a great bulk density of organic matter. They can also be used as volunteer growth to provide a habitat and a food source for generalist beneficial insects that um, also uh, provide um, a benefit to reduction of the use of insecticides potentially. They also obviously provide with through the bulk uh, grazing opportunities for stock and, and other crops can be grown in the mid row as well to provide off other income. And then they can also be used as a vigor regulation tool for vines as well. So in high vigor vineyards, um, there is a great benefit to having um, a competition under vine and mid row with weeds or with species that um, suppress weeds. So here is a, a photograph of a vineyard with under vine strawberry clover, which um, has actually provided probably a bit too much of a stimulus for these vines, but it illustrates that in the right situation, the clover doesn't actually deplete from the soil. It actually helps enhance the growth of those vines. Low vigor vineyards, on the other hand, require no competition from weeds and improvements. Um, in nutrient and water availability um, can be made by increasing organic matter from weeds though, and potentially incorporating them into the soil where they can provide a benefit. A case study uh, where a weed has been used for a benefit in a vineyard is the Battle of Bosworth um, vineyard in McLaren Vale, where sour sobs have been encouraged under vine to provide competition for weeds. And in the process, have provided a picturesque setting, uh, which is very popular with tourists during winter. The weeds die down in the first hot day in spring. And then there seems to be an allelopathic effect from the bulbs from the oxalis, where very few weeds grow for the remainder of the season. There are weeds which we have an obligation to control. Um, most of those are, are identified through um, weed control board websites um, in your regions. So I encourage you to look at those and be familiar with those weeds and the controls that you need to enact. Looking at the productivity of weeds, we can see here that um, where we do provide competition for weeds, we can actually benefit in other ways. So on the left, we have an image from a warm inland area where an alternative crop of zucchinis has been grown, which is not only providing income for the owner, but it is also suppressing weeds in the process by providing competition for that soil and nutrient of water. 
On the right, we have a vineyard, which has obviously um, got a fair bit of biomass, which has been um, just grown over winter, and that will provide um, either mulch to suppress weeds, under vine, it'll help suppress weeds in the mid row and potentially provide fodder um, for livestock if they, that was desired. So as we've been talking about, suppression is undoubtedly probably the most effective way to control weeds. And this work was done back in 1998-99, which illustrates that wallaby grass was able to outcompete wildweed and saltbush was able to outcompete the uh, nasty weed caltrop. Grazing animals in recent years has become very popular uh, to 32% of vineyards surveyed through Sustainable Wine Australia um, have shown that sheep are being used um, during winter for weed control. Livestock, while they are effective for many weeds, um, can actually help spread some weeds, including these challenging weeds such as cooch grass and kikuyu grass. Unfortunately, um, there is um, very few organic options available in controlling these grasses, and that the best way to do them is to get on top of these weeds is um, probably, unfortunately, just to use chemicals at this stage, um, as they will grow through mulches quite readily as well. Um, also, I um, recommend that you don't use mechanical cultivation um, as mowing and cultivation will spread the rhizomes as well. There are some organic weed control agents, um, non-synthetic chemical agents now being made available to viticulture. I'm not gonna go into those in any great detail with this presentation as it's quite a short presentation, but uh, just to bring them to your attention. And these could be options which could be used um, if you didn't want to use synthetic chemicals to control weeds like ryegrass. They seem to have had some effect. This is an image of uh, slasher having an effect on cooch. Um, they act as desiccants. So while um, it looks like the, the grass has died, um, it has only really just been burnt and the uh, rhizomes still um, remain alive. And unfortunately, um, when moisture returns, um, it is likely that that weed will begin to grow again. The costs um, of organic weed control were compared by Darren Fay in a recent trial um, in New South Wales through DPI. And uh, as you can see, um, they can be quite expensive per hectare. Um, and again, the other options that Darren looked at, um, you can see were quite expensive, particularly mulch. Um, but taking into account that the malt costs of mulch need to be amortized out over a number of years, up to three or four years, some situations. One way to potentially better utilize these organic weed control agents um, more effectively is potentially to spot spray. Um, there is technology available. Um, here I've, um, I'm showing the weed seeker, which is commonly available um, and can be used for spot, spot spraying weeds rather than trying to spray out a, a complete strip under vine. <coughs> there were some um, uh, changes to soil. Um, as far as salt and also pH um, from the use of some of the uh, new organic weed control agents. There was generally uh, an increase in pH um, in the more acidic based sprays. Um, and then there was also um, an increase in sodium in most of them as well. The key take home messages from Darren's work were that a combination of approaches across the season generally more effective than just one with weed control. The timing is very important with weed control to um, access um, the plant at a young stage of life um, so that um, you can maximize the benefit. Humidity also seems to have played a role with the effectiveness of some of those herbicides as well with increased humidity aiding the uptake for some reason 
with um, and resulting in a better kill rate. Strategic tillage also can help suppress weed germination and monitoring weeds to prevent um, them from setting seed is important as well. Darren's work did recommend that if you are contemplating the use of mulch um, and straw, then it is best to um, also um, spray weeds off beforehand um, before applying that coverage over the top of the weeds. And always use recommended label rates and rotate herbicide groups to avoid resistance. So I'll just um, introduce a couple of concepts for floor management options for weed control in cool climate viticulture. So in a high vigour situation, uh, one option is to winter graze livestock and then summer mow under vine in the mid row, which has proven very effective in a number of large scale vineyards around Australia. For a low vigour vineyard, winter sowing a cover crop and rolling that crop in spring and mulching under vine is a good option as well. It is important to consider the structure of the soil and a heavier soil um, will potentially require some compaction management, which may um, require shallow rip um, and coulters will help avoid any surface disturbance um, up to every five years, depending upon the soil and the traffic. If you are grazing livestock, um, this may need to happen more frequently due to the compaction effects from, from grazing livestock. Aerating as well as another option, um, just to help with some of um, infiltration of winter rainfall. So aerating firstly um, after autumn rain when the ground is soft and then post grazing in spring is one way just to help with um, stopping water runoff and maximising infiltration. Then if there are problem weeds, um, spot spraying with an organic herbicide or spot spraying with a steamer um, are good options. And also I recommend that you avoid cultivation as we saw from the earlier slides and providing that, that ideal environment for weed germination. So floor management options for weed control in a warm viticultural climate um, where water is um, more of an issue, water availability during the growing season. So if there is um, winter rainfall that can promote an annual crop, then it is recommended that you try and build up as much bulk organic matter that you can in winter, and then utilize that um, mulch for either under vine or rolling in the mid row, and then also um, get the benefits of improved water conservation during the growing season, as well as the weed suppression, and then also potentially um, cooling effect of covering the soil um, during the growing season, particularly close to harvest. It is important to consider that um, if you are in a frost risk area, that um, you need to obviously consider whether um, the benefits outweigh the risks of damage to the crop um, through having um, mid-row coverage. So overall organic weed control considerations, it's good to prepare the vineyard prior to new weed management make sure that the, if there is a bulk of weeds um, currently in the vineyard, that that bulk is removed either by mowing under vine um, and then potentially lowering the seed, weed seed bank and then trying to overcome problems such as kirch prior to going to an organic um, weed control, grazing or mulch in particular. Uh, ensure that the drip lines are raised to a minimum of 400 mil from the soil surface to avoid damage from under vine mowers um, and other undervine machinery. Stake the rat lateral rises on both sides is an important consideration just to um, allow the activation of sensors on undervine weed equipment um, and to avoid them damaging the irrigation system. Be prepared to have higher costs in the first year, um, which should reduce as the vineyard adapts to change in management. So there will generally be a change in weed species which are dominant over time um, and from experienced um, operators that I've spoken to, they see a change from many of the broadleaf weeds through to the grasses over time, which becomes more of a benefit. Be prepared initially for more passes. Um, from speaking to growers, it can be up to four um, when you initially change. 
um, compared to herbicide and then potentially down to about two over time on average. And adapt to the new management conditions. So timing will be different for weed control. Don't let the weeds get too high and try to cultivate soil that's too dry or too wet if you are contemplating cultivation. Monitor the weed growth, which varies according to seasonal conditions. And then if you are um, contemplating improving soil organic matter, potentially utilise weeds by building up bulk initially and then trying to incorporate that into the soil to try and provide a benefit. Having volunteer growth also can help cool, as I mentioned before, soil in the mid row. And overall, adapt your expectations for weed control aesthetics and the workload required to control weeds. I'd just like to acknowledge Darren Fay from DPI New South Wales for his trial results in this presentation. Um, Dr. Chris Penfold um, from University of Adelaide for his undivine crop work um, and philosophies on, on vineyard floor management. And Dr. Peter Vassalis um, from the University of Adelaide who is the uh, herbicide resistance expert. And also, of course, would like to acknowledge Wine Australia for supporting this presentation. Thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Tony, for uh, running through your presentation there. Um, Tony's gonna stick around for a little while. So if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask, please start sending them through now. Quick reminder to ask a question just open the Q&A button on your webinar toolbar, type in a question and click to send it through. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of questions that have come through already, Tony. Um, Hughes asked, I guess, around the definition of a weed. Um, a plant out of place is a traditional definition of a weed. Is that more helpful? Um, particularly when you consider some weeds such as the south sob example that you talked about end up becoming beneficial plants. Do you have anything to, to add around that comment? It's a, it's a good question. I think, uh, yes, so a weed is only really um, a plant out of place if you're not getting or deriving a benefit from that plant. And the south sobs do deliver a benefit to that vineyard. So essentially the definition probably changes for that plant if, um, if we're being technical. Okay, thank you. And Hugh's also asked about uh, strategic use of undervined synthetic chemicals within an integrated program um, and whether there are any issues associated with this. Uh, no, uh, that's a, a fairly traditional approach and, um, and there's no issues with that whatsoever. So long as the chemicals are registered, applied at the right rates, um, according to um, labels, of course, um, and that resistance management strategies are observed. Okay. Um, some soils don't handle cultivation. Do you have any thoughts on that issue? Yes, yeah, a general rule of thumb, and I haven't really recommended many of the cultiv any of the cultivation tools for herbicide management or weed management, uh, mainly because um, the heavy soils, the higher the clay content, generally speaking, the more vulnerable they are to uh, damage to the soil structure um, over time, particularly with repeated cultivation. So sandier soils have a much greater ability to, to tolerate cultivation. Um, and if you are contemplating cultivation, then um, it's encouraged that you only really do it on your sandier soils rather than the heavy soils with the high clay content. Okay, thanks, Tony. Uh, do you have any comments around the suitability of pine needles as a mulch option? I don't. I do believe that they can acidify the soil. Um, so that may be something to, to be careful with. If you already are starting with an acidic soil, you may um, antagonise that situation. But I can take that question on notice and I can find out a bit more information about that. 
Okay, another question here. We have full cover, mid row and undervine of a medic with no other weeds present. present. Do you see any negative? Do you see any negatives in leaving it until it dies naturally in a dry season like now? Or will it remove too much moisture as I want to leave it to set seed for next year? It really depends on a lot of factors. Uh, what forecast rainfall is ahead, um, what recharge you are able to achieve down to depth. Um, ultimately, um, you need to be careful and a lot of work that's been done by Paul Petrie shows that um, recharge of soil prior to the growing season has a significant effect on crop yield. So you need to be careful um, that the vines aren't going to be um, suffering a water deficit going into the start of the season. Um, it also depends on your availability of supplementary water for irrigation as well and whether you have access to um, a lot of water to be able to um, supplement that um, that's taken by the medic. Chris Penfold um, is a big supporter of use of medics in, in vineyards and has seen that they do deliver a great amount of, um, of dry matter um, which can benefit uh, the soil and also provide some, um, some nitrogen fixing as well. So um, you have to weigh up the pros and the cons um, and consider all the factors. I can't give you a straight answer on that, I'm sorry. No problem, thanks Tony. Um, just an FYI, Chris Penfold did do a webinar last year looking at his undervine cover crops um, research. So if anyone's interested, please jump on the AWRI's YouTube channel to check that recording out. Now I've got another question here about mowing as the only management tool. Do you have anything to add to that, Tony? It seems that mowing is probably one of the most cost effective because you can have um, mowing going on under vine as well as um, the mid row at the same time. Um, and generally it's only from speaking to some um, practitioners who have utilised grazing and mowing that the mowing only needs to really occur once or twice um, throughout the whole season. Um, generally speaking, um, a lot of the grasses will die off um, in the first hot weather. Um, no, um, it's, there are other options available, of course, to, um, to control under vine. Um, and it's really what I was looking at was probably the most simplistic approach with the mowing. Okay, we've got a question here about strawberry clover undervine in a vigorous vineyard and whether we can expect that to have an impact on the disease pressure on a canopy of that style via added humidity. Um, it depends on um, how active the strawberry clover remains during the growing season at what growth stage the vines are at. Um, and if the strawberry clover is still thriving or not. Um, I think from Chris's work, he has shown that there is a limited um, influence of humidity that's going to cause problems with um, fungal pathogens. So um, I'll also take that question on notice and I'll do a bit more investigation and get back to you on that question. Thanks for your question, Maddie. Um, what are your expectations of a of nutritional changes or challenges that a grapevine may experience with a living mulch system, both short and long term? I think it, once again, it's going to be site specific and I think you need to, it's not a hands off approach that I'd encourage. I think you need to still monitor and doing the nutrient analysis of the vines, um, as I mentioned at Peach Hill, testing and leaf blades is very important just to see how the vines do adapt. Um, there has been uh, some discussion about the effect of mulching, um, not with a living mulch though, um, but there, there obviously will be a drawdown on some nutrients. It depends on what the soil nutrition was like to begin with, the health of the soil, um, the age of the vines. So there's a lot of factors to consider, but Essentially, if you're monitoring it and if you're testing the vines for nutrient um, status, then you should be able to have a, a quite a good synergistic relationship between a, a growing mulch under vine and above ground with the, with the vines. 
Okay, can you also speak to the timing and size of weed um, in terms of control? Um, Nigel has commented that in the past, he's potentially waited until weeds are too large to gain good control. If you're mowing, then it doesn't matter too much. And some of the, um, the twisters and other, um, some machinery can deal with weeds with bulk and you will, um, if you're trying to improve organic matter, can get a benefit from that. Um, but then if you're cultivating, sometimes it can produce a lot of clumping as well, um, which can make it difficult for um, particularly vineyard pruners um, around winter if they're trying to walk on clumps. Um, it can also um, make it difficult to do further weed control. So um, ideally, um, if you can get weeds before they get um, too tall and in their infancy, in any sort of weed control, that is the best approach. Thanks, Tony. Um, do you see subterranean irrigation as part of an effective weed, weed management system going forward? Uh, yes, but that has to be weighed up with the challenges of maintaining uh, an underground irrigation system. Okay. Um, you mentioned allelopathy with the oxalis. Do we know about allelopathy and the impact on vines by different weeds? Uh, we only have, um, as far as I know, some anecdotal evidence that some of the grasses, such as um, as cooch, um, can have, uh, it appears in a lilopathic effect. Um, and it has been seen in some vineyards um, that potentially the oxalis does have an effect, not so much on the vines, but on the weeds. Um, I, once again, I'll have to take that on notice and see what the current literature is and see if there's anything that I can highlight for you. Okay, and do you have any opinions on the benefits of rolling cover crops and weeds as opposed to mowing or slashing? I'm a, a big supporter of um, rolling mid-rows and um, I did mention that as, a, as an option, um, particularly for the warm inland viticultural climates um, as being a good option. It's also very good for cool climates as well, particularly if there's a low frost risk in the region. Um, there is a benefit over a number of years to rolling the uh, cover crop, um, particularly if it's a, an annual crop um, with a fair bit of bulk and that can remain um, as an effective weed suppressant for up to three years from my experience. Um, under vine, um, uh, it is difficult to, to roll under vine, but um, you could potentially um, try and do some side throwing as well as rolling, but generally it's one or the other um, that you can do unless you did alternative rows. Okay, and do you know any management methods for woody weeds? Um, we have some issues with mustard that has been used as cover crop in the past and produced significant seeds bank. Once again, I would probably suggest that you try and um, bring the, the bulk density down of the weeds if they are quite woody and thick, um, either through mowing um, or trying to um, break them down somehow. Um, once you've been able to do that, then it may be a matter of um, trying to get on top of that weed seed bank um, with some herbicides to have some germination and then be able to um, get those weeds as they germinate. Um, and then once you've done that, if you're able to then put a mulch over the top to suppress the weeds, um, that should be an effective control. Okay, thank you, Tony, for going through all those questions. Looks like that's it with regard to the Q&A side of things. Did you want to add any final comments or say anything before we wrap up, Tony? No, I think I've... All right, thanks. Okay, great. I think we might wrap it up there then. Um, I'd like firstly to extend a large thank you to Tony for providing the content and going through a, a large number of questions. Um, if you do have any additional follow-up questions um, after the session, then please feel free to 
contact um, the AWRI's help desk service. Um, we have just got a last question coming. Do you want to speak to that one, Tony? Uh, we've just had a question um, about the use of alophytes to extract salt um, in soil as a potential strategy of using um, potentially a plant to remove salt. Um, I guess it depends on um, how effective that alophyte is. I have heard of salt bush being used in broad acre um, grazing land to um, remove salt um, from um, paddocks which otherwise were unusable. Um, the salt gets exported, as I understand it, by the livestock when they ingest it um, and then they're sent off and then the salt goes with them. So I'm not sure about um, the time frames involved with that and I'm not sure about as a strategy in viticulture um, how effective that is and what what time frame is required um, to get a benefit. Um, but it is definitely something which um, you can consider. And I did have an image of a, um, a creeping salt bush um, for the warm, warm inland um, practices as a potential mid road coverage plant if um, the soil is subject to some some salinity towards the surface. Okay, thanks Tony for going through that final question. As I was saying, if you do have any further questions following this session, please do contact the AWRI's help desk service. Um, I'd also like to extend a thank you to everyone who's participated in today's session. For attendees, you will receive a follow-up email. That email will include a link to today's recording, which you will be able to find on the AWRI's YouTube channel. Um, the next AWRI webinar is next week, Thursday the 26th of September. Sandy Hathaway from Wine Australia will be discussing a new app which has been developed to map vineyards and assist growers with monitoring crop health. If you'd like to register for this session and haven't done so already, please visit the AWRI webinar. Thank you again and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.